Welcome back to the Crash Course Podcast. My name is Craig Crash Collins, joined as always by Brandon Scott, otherwise known as B. Scott. Let's talk some Pacers. It's been a minute since we covered the Indiana Pacers, talk some NBA basketball. It's when we say it's year two of the rebuild. Was it technically the rebuild last season as well? I think this is, I think we're in going on. I wouldn't say because last year was like a half of half a year rebuild. Yeah. yeah it like, was... So I think we're going on year one. By the end of the year, it'll be year, it'll be one and a half. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, you know currently in the process of rebuilding the Indiana Pacers. They have a direction. Uh, the NBA season, of course, started last week. Uh, we're gonna dive into you know the Pacers start to the season, kind of give our outlook, what we think um, the Pacers' direction is, and what's been what we're uh, what we're impressed by, what we're not impressed by. Diving in uh, to the 2022-2023 uh, version of the Indiana Pacers. But before we get into all that, B Scott. How was your week? How was your vacation? My vacation was nice. Spent some time in the sun down in Orange Beach. Ate a lot of shrimp. I found out my uh, two-year-old son loves shrimp as well. So his nickname has become Shrimp Little Shrimp Basket. Um, nice. But yeah, how how's, how's been your time off? You've been pumping out the content like crazy across all of your channels. Yes. It's like nuts. Yes. I mean... You know, you, you're right in the thick of the IHSAA sectionals. I got a lot of grief because I picked Oak Hill to win their sectional. They lose uh, on uh, the Crash Kiss of Death is alive. There it is. A it's making of, its debut uh, in the IHSAA. See, I, I'm, really, I'm really contemplating releasing because um, I think I, I'm pretty sure I can find the YouTube video that catalogs the origin of the Crash Kiss of Death, and I'm contemplating taking that and making it into a TikTok and posting that because a lot of the TikTok followers over 2K now, they don't know. They don't know about the they Crash don't. Kiss of Death. They don't know where the no, origins this come from. Way back. Yeah, before, probably, you know, when they were in diapers. Um, you know, um, it's... Before uh, TikTok. Yeah, before, way before TikTok, way before Vine, <laughs> way before any of that. So Back um, when we were young men. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, the Crash Kiss of Death is, is already alive and well. Um, yeah, it's some big games. I'm really excited because, of course, this week uh, we'll have the uh, 5A and 6A schools getting underway. So the tournament will be in full force. And I've, I'm really excited. Um, once we get through sectionals, I want to do a tier list. Um, of the teams that are left, who I think is going to win state. So a lot of content down the pike if you're if you're into some high school football content as well. Of course, we'll be covering the Colts and Pacers on the podcast as well. But yeah, we uh, over the last week we we've been live uh, every Friday through the uh, sectional tournament, or that's the plan at least. Um, so we've been releasing, I've been recording that live on Friday nights. Then releasing that on i think i try to get it out on saturdays i think by the time everything processes on friday i don't have time to turn it around to saturday so it's just gonna be sundays now um you know so to kind of recap if you missed the live you, you know kind of get our reactions uh get get the reaction of the uh of the sexual game so yeah content content galore i've been i've been trying to get kind of on a schedule make sure i can get all that pumped out can you give us a little bit of a hint who your sick who you believe your 6a champ will be just a hint. Oh, you don't dude. have to say it fully. It's, no, it's fine. It's it's so up in the air right now. It really is because I mean you've got, you've got Cathedral was our pick at the beginning of the year, and I'm just not so sure. I mean you have Brownsburg. They play Ben Davis. Uh, you have Jaden Whitaker. Who uh, who knows if he'll be at 100 percent healthy? If he's not, heck, they could go down. Hamilton Southeastern is just all the bounces have been going their way, but then you've got a Fishers team that only lost by one to them in overtime. So I mean, right. you've you've got I mean, Carmel and Westfield are are gonna you know have have a good game. Square in off this Friday, right? Exactly. So I mean, you've got it's just I I I don't know that I can I mean we can I can default back to Cathedral since they were my preseason pick, but I I mean can't count out Center Grove, can't you know Cathedral's been good, been day uh, you know can't been, count um, out Carmel even Carmel's defense is is good, right? So I mean I don't know if I can give you an update on it just because it's so up in the air. Like I I need to see I I could maybe do it after this weekend because at least I will have seen you know one game of the sectionals to see how these teams come out after you know the regular season come out in playoff form. But yeah, right. It's I mean a, a lot of the state tournaments are like that where you know yeah you've got your favorites but 
flip the coin uh, as far as as who you think is going to actually win it because uh, you know there's a lot of teams that are really good. Unfortunately, my alma mater is playing Cathedral. Yeah, that's Friday night. So, oh, sorry, Lawrence North. I, yeah, you are not winning a state championship in football. Promising. Still. Promising start to the season, but after after that, not not so much not so much later. But you know who else hasn't really, or who hasn't had a promising start to the season this year so far? It's the Indiana Pacers, as they are one and three on the season. I mean, but they've they've but that had, is promising. That's promising. promising for the rebuild, right? Promising because there have been um some high points so far. So let's go yes, ahead. Yes, that's very true. Dive into the Indiana Pacers season so far. Uh going back to last week, the season opener, they lose 114 to 107 to the Wizards. Tyrese Halliburton, he scores 25 points, 7 assists, but he healed has 16 points, 10 rebounds. Uh game 2 on the season, they lose 137 to 134 at home to the Spurs. That's not great cuz of Spurs are another rebuilding team. You'd like to see a but win. No, that's in- that is good. That is good. Just seeing them lose <laughs> and and make sure they can well. If you if you are trying to get Frank Wembanyama, losing to the Spurs is something that needs to be done. True. Yeah, I mean that's fair. Um, in that game, Halliburton go, uh, scores twenty seven points, has twelve assists. Assists. Uh, six overall pick Benedict Mathurin uh, out of Arizona. He had twenty six points, five rebounds. Uh, game three, uh, the Pacers do get the win, one twenty four to one fifteen over the Pistons. Tyrese. Uh, Halliburton had 24 points, 10 assists. Jalen Smith, who re-signed this offseason, he had 19 points, 15 rebounds. Mathurin, 27 points off the bench, 7 rebounds, a sick windmill dunk. And then, of course, um, on Monday, uh, the Pacers lose to the Philadelphia 76ers, 120-106. to 106. Tyrese Halliburton, 19 points, 10 rebounds. Mathurin had 18 points as well. So, I mean... The one and three on the season, of course, they will play um, tonight against the Chicago Bulls, um, and so I mean, could you know another playoff caliber team from the Eastern Conference, um, you know, and so you know, kind of looking at the season so far, some of the takeaways, um, you know, what surprised me so far um, is you know, yes, the season is young, but it gives you some hope uh, for the rebuild on all f- uh, that all five of the Pacers uh, that are averaging over ten points per game. Um, none were in Indy as of February first of last year, of this year. Um, you've got Halliburton doing well. You've got Heel do, doing well. You have Mathurin doing well. Um, you know you have these young guys who are new to the team, haven't even been with the organization a full year, really taking flight. Um, that's one of the early indicators that there are some positive things brewing in the rebuild. And oh, by the way, Chris Duarte isn't one of those five Pacers that are averaging, um, you know, over. Uh, 11 or over 10 points per game. So as much as we like what Duarte did last season, and as much as we like the Duarte pick in general, I mean, he's not even been a super big factor um, on the season so far. So these are these other guys that are kind of coming out of the woodwork, the Halliburtons, uh, the Mathurins that are really taking charge here early on. Um, and the biggest surprise for me too, is the fact that the Pacers are in the top five, uh, in the league in terms of points per game. Uh, they're the top 10 in rebounds and top three in block shots. Obviously, uh, you know, it's a small sample size and they're, you know, these aren't the metrics that people get into. I'm sure there's, you know, basketball experts that are like, none of those stats matter, but, um, you know, just that to have the Pacers points per game has to matter. Well, but at I mean, some point. well, but it's just kind of like, it's like, you know, batting average in RBI in baseball. People are like, well, uh, if you want to look at, uh, you know, actually the stat that matters is war and, and uh, ball, you know, Babbitt, but uh, batting average on balls in play, which I still, I mean, I'm a big baseball fan. I'm not entirely sure what is different between Babbitt and, and regular batting average, but um, you know, it's, um, it, you know, there's a lot of people now are, you know, looking at more advanced metrics. So I'm sure there'd be like, well, you know, if you look at the, you know, points per, you know, or your points per possession or points per, you know, if you look at the per, you know, whatever. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a more advanced metric that factors in points per game, but factors in 18 other things that people would say, well, you know, that blows points per game out of the water. But um, it's probably offens- offensive efficiency rating. Right. Yes, that's yeah, it, it's something like that. But, you know, um, I think, you know, 
the Pacers probably do fall middle of the road in some of those more advanced ma- metrics. Um, but if I recall, I mean, their slow start to the season last year was in large part because uh, they couldn't score late in games. They were blowing big leads uh, when they started 1-6 and six last year. So, um, you know, I think they're coming together. They're a young team. Um, and they've shown some, even though, they, again, they are 1-3, and three, but they have shown some strides early in the season that they can get things done. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's not that big of a surprise that they're at top five in the league in scoring right now, especially when you got a guy coming off the bench that can drop 27, you know, or 26, whatever, you know, any given night. But that kind of leads me into what my biggest surprise is. It's definitely how quickly Benedict Mathurin has gelled into his role and figured out how to become or a scorer in the NBA. I mean, the fact that the Pacers have two guys that are more than two guys, really, that can come out any given night and drop over 25 points is quite a luxury. So to me, that's a big surprise. Um, and that does help you when you look at the future. Obviously, is Buddy Heald a part of the plan of the future? I don't know. I Near future, maybe. Distant future, probably not. But... Um, I mean, you look at this young core, it is definitely exciting because your two two of your best players are young, super young, are on, on rookie deals, essentially. You know, then you got some good young veteran presence in like Jalen Smith, aka Sticks. Um, and there's something that about this Pacers team, yes, they're going to lose a lot of games this year. They're going to take their lumps but they're going to be fun to watch. You know, it, it's going to be kind of weird. Like people are going to go to these games knowing that the Pacers are most likely going to lose, but they're just excited to see this team because really I, I it's funny. Like if you would have asked me a few months ago, which team do you think that we did this? We did. We looked, which team has a brighter future right now, the Colts or the Pacers. I would definitely then would have said the Colts, but now I'm like, Hmm. The Pacers have a clear plan, and they also have a bright, bright future because these young players are clicking. They're not clicking well enough to not be in a rebuild, but they're clicking, and it's it's exciting. I think it's a surprise that Halliburton and Mathurin are becoming such a deadly duo, and to have Mathurin coming off the bench, uh, that's – <laughs> that's a talk about a luxury for a rebuild team. Not many rebuild teams can say they have, a, they have a guy they're bringing off the bench. That's averaging over 25 points a game. That's nuts. I mean, it's not going to hold up. Let's just be honest. That's that those types of numbers coming off the bench are not going to hold up, but to have somebody that can be a legit number one score coming off the bench can't you yeah. don't tell me the well, future is not bright i mean yeah it's just it just is it's promising because they're showing flashes of what they can be and could be and could you know evolve into mm-hmm. and what's great is that these guys are growing into that just about the time where you are going to start beginning to really truly see the changing of the guard within the nba you're getting at the end of the era of LeBron James. The Golden State Warriors are eventually going to have to break up because they are too ex- they, they can't afford to keep that going. There's going to be a changing of the guard within the NBA and I feel like the Pacers are going to be hitting their stride right about the time that changing of the guard takes place and they have the they they have the ability if they can just see it through, stay patient, make the right moves like they've been doing here the past year they can come out the other end looking really, really good and being a legitimate contender again. Yeah. Now, um, it hasn't, you know, been all sunshine and rainbows. There are some things we could see the Pacers improve on, um, you know, on the season. Um, you know, you know, even with a lot of the surprising things we've seen so far, um, you know, going off of what I said earlier, Chris Duarte has yet to get going this season. If he can get going while Mathurin and Halliburton are going, this team, this team can go on. I mean, not go on any crazy, you know, insane run, but they can string some wins together for sure if they can get all of those guys clicking at the same time. And also mentioning, you know, the points per game and all that stuff. 
you know, that's all great, but also the Pacers are 20th or worse in field goal percentage and three-point percentage. So, obviously, if the if the good scoring numbers are going to stay, those numbers also have to go up. Um, so, yeah, still some still some evidence that the Pacers are not exactly where you want them. Yeah, so for me, looking at improvements, it has to come on the defensive side of things. The Pacers have shown they have the ability to score lots of points. Obviously, you're top five in the league in points per game right now. Like I just mentioned, Benedict Mathurin coming off the bench is an unbelievable weapon. But you have to make those key stops within the game if you want to win. And I, I know right now it's tough because you are going through a Miles Turner injury yet again. Um, and he is a difference maker come on the, come the defensive side of the, the court. I mean, he's typically at the top three in the, in the league and uh, block shots per game. Obviously I think you're, you can see the growth of Isaiah Jackson with Turner, not being out there, um, which is good. I think once you see his emergence on the defensive side of things, cause I mean, he has the ability to be that, that type of player. Um, things could change a little bit, but I really need to see improvement defensively. I mean, I know some, come on, you people are like, Brandon, it's, it's the NBA. They don't really play defense in the NBA, but you need to play a little bit in order to come out on top of some of these contests. You, you, you've proven you've got the ability to put the points up, but you have the ability to make key stops to make sure that your opponents don't put those points up. For sure. So um, let's go into uh, some hot or cold questions here on the Indiana Pacers. Um, and we're going to kind of, you know, break down what we think the outlook of the Pacers season is going to be. Um, and so starting off, uh, you know, first of all, if you haven't, you know, pay, if you haven't paid attention to the podcast, first of all, what are you doing? Second of all, um, if you uh, hot or cold is basically is, you know, I'll say a take and B Scott and I will debate if it's a hot take or a cold take. So, uh, first, uh, hot or cold question is the Pacers will win more than 22 games uh, this season. That was their uh, mark on DraftKings. 22 and a half um, was what their number was. Um, and for me, I do think that's a hot take. You know, you do you do look at it the, after the All-Star break last season and after all the moves the Pacers made, acquiring Halliburton, Heald, etc. The Pacers were 5-17, and 17, which would equal out to an 18-win season. Um, but... The Pacers haven't had fewer than 23 wins since 1984-1985 and have only had two seasons of 22 or fewer wins since 1980. So even through all the dysfunction and craziness the last two seasons, um, they still were able to be above that win or threshold. I mean, you have, you, know, you have the season you know, with Nate Bjorkren a couple of years ago where the wheels kind of fell off. They still won 34 games that year. Um, you know, you had last year, you know, they were still able to get 25 wins despite all the craziness. So um, I just think they can build chemistry. There are early signs that they can string together 23 or more wins. I can see them more around 25 or 26. I think they will improve. I think they can, like I said, I think they can maybe, you know, string four or five, six wins in a row together just with, you know, all the all the players they have all the you know potential raw talent that they have i think they can go on a little bit of a run i don't i i, I don't know 18 18 to 22 wins just felt low to me and i know like at the end of the day 25 26 isn't all that much better but i i do think i do think the pacers can get there see this is a tough one because if the pacers are a borderline like have have the ability to have one of the highest percentages to land the number one pick come late in the season. I could see them going all in for that. I don't know. But at the same time, you're going to have these teams eventually that, oh, the Pacers are not that good. The, the better teams are going to be like, okay, we can rest some of our starters now. And the Pacers could pick up a few yep. here and there by, by that. I mean, of course, then also this team last year, played all the starters of the Boston Celtics at, at the, end, the end of the year and just annihilated them. So it's, it is, that's a tough one. I, I am going to say cold. Cause I think they get 22. 
<laughs> they don't get more than 22. So I'm going to take the under of the 22 and a half. I'm going to go right at the 22 mark. Um, I could see them right in that 18 to 22 range, which I think if, if they end up getting more and it puts them out of reach, potentially out of reach for a top three pick, I think the fan base will be disappointed. You know, I think right now the fan base is so all in on the rebuild that they want to see, especially this next year when the Pacers have so many draft picks in the first round. And it's a really strong opportunity, especially if you do land number one to get a player like Frank Wembignana, who looked really good against an NBA team in the preseason. Um, Actually, no, it was the G League at Ignite that he played against. And I mean went off so a seven footer that can do it all yeah it it, it the potentials there to really build yourself a big three a young big three i i think that draw might keep them below the 22 mark yeah that's i mean that's probably more realistic i just looking at the numbers it just felt low to me so so we'll see um uh, but it is a totally a Pacers thing to do to go out and win like 27 games and, you know, well, be remember, sitting on the fringe of the lottery. It's like, oh, come on. You can't even do a rebuild, right? <laughs> well, I remember a couple of years ago, like when they made the play in tournament, we we're like, no, <laughs> just to lose, yeah, sure. please. <laughs> um, now, speaking did of. Did they end up getting through the play? No, they no, lost they, in the play in tournament. Did they lose both games or did they win one? I think they won one. Yeah. I was like, oh, come on. No, no, no. Stop. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because if you're the seventh seed and you win versus the eighth seed, you're in. Yeah, the winner of the 9-10 game plays the seven eight. So, yeah, they, they won one and then they lost eighth seed game or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's nuts. Um, but speaking of the play-in tournament, uh, this question, or this take was made when I was like, "Oh, the Eastern Conference is bad," but I was like, eh, "I don't know that they're bad enough for the for the Pacers to get there." Um, but the, well, pa- I mean, the Philadelphia just got their first win of the season against the Pacers. True. Um, the Pacers will uh, hot or cold. The Pacers will make the play-in tournament. Uh, for me, that's cold. Um, you know, the biggest question is how many teams do you think will, or at least have a good chance at finishing higher than the Pacers? Uh, in the Eastern Conference, let's start with the teams who finished below them in 2021, 2022. That was Detroit and Orlando. I think they can still be better than Detroit. Um, Orlando actually might be a little bit better this season uh, with Paolo. Um, you know, now that team might be off and running. Um, the teams- I don't know. Detroit did Detroit did beat the game one, and Paolo dropped like 39. So, Uh-oh. So maybe not. Maybe the Pacers are better than Orlando. Um, the teams who finished above them, the Heat, Celtics, Bucks, 76ers, Raptors, Bulls, Nets, Hawks, and Cavs will all finish above the Pacers again. The Hornets, Knicks, and Wizards are all wild cards, but regardless, I don't think the Pacers are going to be good, uh, close to a playoff spot. Like, cause, because even if, like, let's say all that comes true, let's say Orlando is better, uh, but they, but the, and the Pacers can finish above, like, let's say two of those three, the Hornets, Knicks, and Wizards, like, there's that's still, like, 11th or 12th in the East. And so that's not good enough to get the play-in tournament. So even if they are technically an improvement, which would be 13th in the East last year, so even if they're 12th or 11th, that's still not going to be good enough to make the play-in tournament, obviously. So um, I think that is a cold take for me. Yeah, I'm going to go with a cold take as well. Obviously, I think they're going to be in the 18 to 22 win range. I don't think they're going to get close to the play-in tournament, um, which is a good thing. I've gone. I've already. I've yeah. talked about that at at length. It's a good thing, folks. If the Pacers don't win this year, that's that's fine. It's okay. Just enjoy enjoy the young talent and look towards the future. Yes, absolutely. Um. So, um, the final hot or cold question is: Hot or cold? Buddy Heald and Miles Turner will finish the season on the team. Uh, for me, that is lukewarm. So I guess for Luke lumping it together, I will say cold. Um, but I'm, but the official answer is lukewarm. Um, I think Miles Turner is gone. I know that everyone, including us, has been speculating on Miles Turner getting traded forever. I know that like the last two seasons, like you know, I think I think 
uh, there was a year where I said it was going to happen at the beginning of the year, and then in the middle of the year I said it was going to happen, and it still obviously didn't happen either of those times. So, you know, Turner is in the final year of his contract, and especially if injuries are still concerned, the Pacers may just want to move him to get at least something back. If he can, like, be healthy for a little bit, maybe they can get, you know, maybe they can get somebody to buy low on him. Um, you know, um, not necessarily meaning they should not get good value, but getting something would be better than just letting him walk and not get anything. Um, uh, but that kind of leads me into what I think about healed because healed is still under contract for this season and next The Pacers can take their time and try to find the best deal. Uh, or if this unit continues to gel, I'm, I'm good with Indiana just keeping healed, um, on the team. Um, now, you know, there is a chance that Heald and Turner, uh, could be moved together, but I personally would like to, you know, want to see, uh, Heald in a Pacers uniform. Um, I do think that, you know, because the Pacers will likely have a, another high draft pick this season, um, I think they're better off keeping Heald to try to package him and maybe a couple of draft picks to try to move up if that's possible. Um, although, I mean, I, I obviously know that, you know, some of the teams that will be, you know, obviously the other teams at the top of the draft are not going to want because they also need good players, so they're not going to be. They I mean, also want Frank. Yeah, exactly. So they're going to be less likely, but there, there's, there might be one or two teams that like, okay, well, we just got hit with the injury bug. We, you know, had a, you know, we're going to be back next year, you know, ready to make a playoff run. Like, let's say, you know, the the. Uh, this won't happen, but this is just the first t- team that popped in my head. The Celtics have kind of been mired in, in you know, dysfunction and controversy, or even maybe the Nets, let's say. Not, the Nets seem a little bit more, uh, you know, outrageous than saying the Celtics would, would happen. But, like, let's say something, you know, the Celtics just have a terrible year and end up, you know, with a higher draft pick with the Pacers, which that would be insane. But, um, you know, let's say that ends up happening. You could, you know, I think, you know, that that's basically the example is just to say there there could be a team that feels like they're already there and kind of you know doesn't feel you know would be better off taking more draft picks you know to build depth as opposed to having you know they already have their star players there so you know i think you could potentially move healed in a couple of draft picks to move up with that team if that were to happen so i'd rather the pacers hold on to healed to try to make that happen as opposed to moving healed and like I would rather let Turner walk and and do that with healed than just trade them both together to get probably not even close to that value back. So I I I want to see healed stay, but um I and, and, and that's what I'm pulling for, but if he has to go I'd rather he be kind of the chip they use to to really make some strides. Well, your theory with the Celtics would not work because if the Celtics get in the lottery, I believe, our top six, then we don't get their first round pick. <laughs> and that's one of the picks we would have to package with Yield. Yeah. Uh, so go Celtics. Um, same thing, go Cavs. Um, we need we need those first round picks. Um, yeah, I, I like your answer of lukewarm here because I, I think Miles Turner is gone. He's a trade, de- he's a deadline deal right, he's written all over him right now because expiring contract for one two some team that thinks they are a a piece or two away from being a legitimate contender they can make a run is going to overpay for miles turner and that benefits the pacers trading him going into the season you're not going to get as much of a value in return but if the lakers for instance let's say are right there fringe of contender or maybe in or not in i could see them you know okay we'll take buddy Hield, miles turner we'll give you our two for we'll give you those two first round picks and russell westbrook done deal here you go i mean that's the type of deal i could see ultimately end up happening some team that is like oh we really need that he's our that missing piece he's that player we need right now um heck even a golden state warriors team it's going to be one of these teams that you're that are up there near the top that are going to swoop in and either trade for him to keep their, their competitor from getting him or think grab him because they know they need him Um, or some kind of knee jerk reaction. Somebody else is going to make a big move. So they're going to think, feel like they need to make a big move. Kind of like the Pacers did back in the day when it was them in the heat in the Eastern conference, 
the Heat went out and signed Greg Odens. The Pacers panicked because, like, oh, man, now they got another big guy. So we went out and signed Andrew Bynum. (laughs) And neither one of those guys contributed (laughs) to either of the teams. So uh, it's going to be – I mean, it's not going to be, like, that situation where Miles Turner is not going to be a contributor somewhere, but it's going to be that it could, you could see a situation like that. Like somebody makes a big move and golden States like, okay, we got to make a move. But the Lakers like, we got to make a move to keep up. And like the Pacers are like, well, you can have them for this large asking price. Um, so I think he's definitely a deadline deal type guy. I do think you are correct on buddy healed. I, unless a team is willing to, say, hey, we'll give you all of this, a King's Ransom for Heald and Turner. I, I could see Heald being kept around for a while because he is a veteran presence. This is a young team, and yeah, he's still fairly young, but he he's I think he's like the oldest guy on the team right now. Yeah. And you do need a player. You need players like that in your locker room. He's, he's a locker room guy. He's a fan favorite. You keep him. Well, and not only that, it's just the fact that he and he's also been like good, like he's been a significant contributor early in the season. It's right. not like he's not like okay, he's given us like ten points here and there. He's not like a the, T.J. McConnell. Yeah, or you know, even um, why why is the name escaping me? The 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 guy from Creighton. Um, Oh, Doug McDermott. Doug McDermott. Was. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, not to say that I mean we enjoyed when those those guys played for the Pacers, but. I mean, McConnell it's... plays for the Pacers still. I know. Uh, I just I'm I'm in a um like McDermott. McDermott, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, you know, it's 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 he's being a he's a significant tr- contributor while being a veteran presence. So, and I think that, and right. I don't, and I also don't think that he's, you know, they can they can afford to wait and see like kind of what is you know because I mean, he's still got a year left you know after this season on his contract they can kind of explore what you know an extension would mean how much that would be like i i would rather them be patient and they can and they can really take their time than be like okay we have to make this move happen we're all in on the rebuild because i mean if you can keep a, a guy like buddy healed around i mean i'm all for that yeah exactly all right, so we're also going to uh, talk the, uh, about the NBA as a whole, give our predictions. Yeah, I know the season started, but there's 82 games. We won't; These pr- predictions won't matter until April, May anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about who we think um, are going to uh, uh, be uh, the NBA champions and talk a little bit about the NBA as a whole. But first, let's talk about the friends of the show. Uh, first of all, from Anchor, the Crash Course Podcast is brought to you by Anchor. Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to start? Look no further than Anchor.fm. Anchor allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your computer or mobile device and will distribute it to other sites such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. On a budget, not only is Anchor completely free of charge, but will allow you to make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor.fm to get started. Anchor, it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Eat also the Crash Course Podcast is brought to you by Eat Lunch and Board Game, heard weekly on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, and wherever podcasts can be heard, board games build bridges. Um, so quickly here we're gonna give our uh predictions for the NBA season. I know, like I said, it's about a week or so late, but it's fine. It, it it's okay. Uh, you know, there's still plenty of seasons left. I don't think anyone's ready to crown a champion um a week into the season. Um, so we're going to give our East uh, Finals predictions, our West Finals predictions, and then who's going to win the NBA Finals. I'll give my East and West first. You give your East and West, B. Scott, then we'll talk about the Finals. Um, for me, uh, in the East, I've got the Bucks over the Cavs uh, in the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, the Bucks uh, title defense kind of ended with a thud last season. They were a three seed in the East. Uh, they lost in the Conference Semifinals. I think they do bounce back. I, I, I want them. I think they can have a strong uh, bounce back type of season. I do like the move of Donovan Mitchell for the Cavs. They seem like the kind of a fun surprise team, kind of like the Suns were a couple of years ago before we knew you know they were going to make that crazy finals run. Um, so I do think they can uh, go on a run. Plus, depending on seeding, if they get a team like the 76ers who struggle in the semis or a team that's going through some dysfunction like the Celtics or Nets, um, I think they can fully take advantage. So I, I, I like the uh, the Bucks and over the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. In the West, I have the Warriors over the Clippers. Uh, the Warriors are back. 
Um, not back back, not 2017, not 2018, not 2016 back. Um, but I do think they have a team. Uh, they are the team at the top of the West. That I think I, you know, that I have the most faith in. Um, as far as who can go deep and, and get it done. Uh, the Clippers do get Kawhi and Paul George back in full force, uh, but until I see the Clippers actually win a conference, I can't really predict it. Um, I, <laughs> I will I will tell the Clippers, uh, if it makes anybody who listens out there uh, who's a Clippers fan, uh, I rearranged the seating to make the Clippers make the uh, – because, I, of course, you know me. I, I did the whole seating thing, went through the playoffs. Oh, yeah. Head. Um, he had an Excel spreadsheet and everything. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so I originally, I think had the Warriors and Grizzlies, but then I was like, you know what? I don't know if I like the Grizzlies over the Clippers. So I was like, okay, let's rearrange this a little bit. Let's make it to where the Clippers get a little bit more of a favorable, fav- more favorable second round matchup. So, um, I, I do, I do think the Clippers get their Warriors over the Clippers. So that sets up an NBA finals of the Bucks and Warriors. So for me in the East, I actually have the Celtics coming out over the Miami Heat. Um, I don't think the Celtics are as dysfunctional as you think. They're they're dysfunctional up at the top. And I don't think the players are really letting that um, affect them too much. Look, Joe Missoula is a really, he's going to be a good coach. Like that makes me feel old. I remember watching Joe Missoula play at West Virginia. And um, I mean, he, it, I don't think they, they're going to miss a beat. I watched them opening night against the, the 76ers, and they looked really good. Um, so I can see that. I can see them. They Losing to the Warriors last year in the finals left a bad taste in their mouth. So I, I think they get back. In the West, I have the Warriors over the Denver Nuggets. Um, I think the Denver Nuggets finally make a run in the playoffs, but – the Warriors just have that – they know what it takes at that time of year. And that is – that's key. So I, I – for my NBA Finals, I have a rematch from last year set up. <laughs> oh, I know. So original. I but, mean, hey, hey, welcome it, to the NBA. Honestly, it could happen. I mean, it happens in the NBA, I feel like, more than any other sport where you see – Oh, yeah. The same like, team. how many times did we see the Chicago Bulls and the Seattle Supersonics or the Utah Jazz – well, and even, you know, how many times did we see the Warriors and the Cavs, you know, a couple of years ago? True. Um, you know, so it, it had happened so much. Um, you know, so NBA Finals between the Bucks and Warriors, I don't have a whole lot of analysis on this one because it's it's if those if that were to happen as a coin flip, I'm gonna go with the Bucks just because I think I, I don't know, you, you very rarely you see a lot of um a lot of you know the kind of the same teams up around the top making the finals, but you don't see a ton of repeats. I mean, I know the, the Warriors did it uh, not too long ago, but we've still seen like the Raptors come through and the Bucks come through, and you know all this kind of stuff. So I I don't know if necessarily we'll see, um, you know the Warriors go back to back. I'm not ready to pick that yet, just because there is some good parity at the top. Um, but I I'm gonna go with Giannis and the Bucks. I think that they want to make that title defense. I think. Um, you know, I think they can get that second title. So, like I said, not a ton of analysis here, just because I think it would be if this were to happen, it's you know it would be super close. So there's no like you know uh you know in, on October 25th, I don't think there's a whole lot of you know analysis to be had there, just because they are so close. We don't know what their season holds for either of them yet. But I'm going Bucks over Warriors. So I'm actually going with Celtics over Warriors this time. I mean, it was a close series last season it was a close one it was a good one i think the celtics made the necessary moves to put themselves in a position that they are better than the warriors they're deeper now i mean look at the moves they made they made the trade for uh malcolm brogdon so he's he's pretty good defensively and he's a good shooter as well so that kind of helps there um I think one of the more underrated signings that they had, which was late in the off season, almost right before preseason started was the addition of Blake Griffin. Um, having Blake Griffin come off the bench and be a solid veteran presence, a physical player. That is something that can really counteract against the warriors. Um, I just think the Celtics now are deeper than they were last year. And I think that's going to be the big push for them to get them over the edge and have them come home as NBA champs. 
Honestly, Blake Griffin is somebody that I wouldn't mind seeing get an NBA title. Um, I know. Because, like, I don't know I mean, if it's just because he was on the cover of NCAA Basketball 10, like one of the last college basketball games. I, I like the way he played at Oklahoma. Like It was just fun to watch him back in the day. So, um, And even with you know in the early days uh, with the Clippers. Um, with the Clippers. Yeah he, yeah, he was really fun to watch. So that that's a guy I would not mind seeing win an NBA title before. He's, like, he's one of those guys where, like, because you know, once the finals come around, obviously you know the Pacers season is is long over. There's you know I don't really have a dog in the fight, so unless it's you know obviously if LeBron's in it, it's whatever team's playing LeBron. But if you know if, <laughs> if he's not if he's not in there and I don't have a dog in the fight, I'm like you know what you know wh- who's that one player that's like you know on the roster that you know d- doesn't get a doesn't a starter, but I want to see him get a title, and and Blake Griffin would be that guy for me with the Celtics. Yeah, see, it would make it even better, though, like with the Celtics, if Brad Stevens was still the head coach. Yeah, true. You know, but him being the GM now or president, whatever, whatever I don't know what his role. I mean, he's up there. Um, he's still going to get a, a championship regardless. But yeah, like last year, I didn't have a dog in the fight between the Warriors and the Celtics. And it was like one of those. It's like, I really I just want to see a good series. Because either one of those teams, I don't mind seeing win. Like for some reason, even though the the Warriors have won so many titles here as of late, like I don't really mind it because a player like Steph Curry, I can really get behind. You know that underdog type yeah. player. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and I think it's because it of the way. It's kind of every. I mean, obviously, there's a guy on the team that you know people love to hate and don't you know always enjoy. You either love him or you love him or you hate him. And Draymond Green, obviously, you know that's kind of the polarizing uh, figure on that. Say, team. I like him. Well, no, I'm I'm just saying. I, I, I would have loved if he was a Pacer. Yeah. Well, I remember. Heck, I remember working with you know not to name drop here, but you know Mate, uh when uh, he was still the producer of uh, JMV uh, when. Um, uh, we were doing we for those we, of you that don't know Mate, that's Matt Taylor, the the play by play voice of the Indianapolis Colts. Yes. Um I remember he was like we were doing all this draft prep for the NBA draft and Draymond Green, we were trying to trying to book a uh uh you know, somebody from Michigan State because that was one of the guys that was pr- projected to go to the the Pacers was uh was was Draymond Green. I remember doing all that prep and then finally seeing who they got. And I was like, this wasn't any of the people that, <laughs> that we were looking who at. They, was... It, was, it was, it was like the, would have been like the 2010, 2011 or 2012 draft. I don't remember who they got um, in the first round. I, I it wasn't anybody that's, was it, it was Tyler Hansbro. No, it was, I, I can, I can tell you for sure. It was not Hansbro because it was that Hansborough's run with North Carolina was like, Oh, nine, 10, like 10. I wouldn't have been at 1070 yet. So it, it was it was okay. like a year. Or it two was later. later. Yeah, it was it was a it was. Got it. I think he was a player out of Duke. I don't remember. Or wait, was it? It wasn't. No, the, it, wasn't. it wasn't the. It wasn't the George Hill Kawhi year. I think it was. No, the, that it, was or, that was the first year I was at ten seventy. So it was the year after that. Whoever their first was it, Turner. No. No, because the year after Turner was like a year or two later. I think here I kind of <laughs> want to look it up, but. Georgie's Nyang. <laughs> it it could have been. Could have been, honestly. Um yeah, but, um, they were picking later. Because that was You're gonna make me look this up, aren't you? Let's I am. See. Yeah. Um all right, so first let of all me, the, let me check my notes. Yeah. Well the first uh, you know, trail we have to go on is Draymond Green, because I don't remember exactly which draft this was. Um, so I have to go to Draymond was, Green, yeah. Um, and his Wikipedia page, or even his basketball reference page. Let's see that he was going to tell me he was drafted 2012 NBA draft because his debut was October 31st, 2012. So 2012 NBA draft. Let's see, 2012 NBA draft. Um, Wikipedia. I remember when Wikipedia people like teachers were like, you can't get anything from that. And that's like all that. Uh, I get a lot from Wikipedia. Yeah. Let's see. The Indiana Pacers. Who did they get? Um. Why, okay. So is it seriously not going to show me the team? Uh. Let's see. Let's see. Scrolling down, scrolling down. Pacers. My, uh, was it Miles Plumley? 
I feel like that's that's a name that I would have recognized. Uh, that would be about right. Yeah. Duke. Okay. Yeah. So that, but because it was the Draymond, the Draymond draft. So unless, yeah, unless it was, was. He, was he? Oh yeah, there's Draymond Green. So yeah, it was, it was, and I, yeah, because I think that's what made it even more kind of shocking was because Draymond was still on the board. Uh, when uh, and we took yeah Miles Plum. Now let's see who's yeah. having a better career. Who's stood out? Well, so, um. So yeah, so you have the polarizing player in Draymond Green or whatever, but yeah, you, like you said, you've got Steph Curry, who's just a very likable personality. You've got a team that has really you know built themselves. You know, this isn't a team that's been because that's also true too, is because this was the team that was like you know the likable characters, homegrown talent, and when they kind of rose to prominence, it was against LeBron, who you either love him or you hate him, who has who you know demands that he have. You know, a coach that just you know you know submits to him and and he bows has, to him and has players that he you know picks out and forces all these trades. So you kind of had you know the good of Steph Curry versus the quote unquote evil of LeBron. And so I think that also kind of and then the Warriors up. had to go and taint it a little bit by getting Kevin Durant. <laughs> um, but so I mean, I, yeah. So I think you've you've got all that because I mean, you look at the other you know, kind of teams that have gone on runs, um, you know, in other sports, you know, Alabama, uh, you know, I think it's just because their fan base is, I'm, I'm going to probably, you know, piss off a lot of fan bases here that are listening to the podcast, but um, I mean, you've got, you know, Alabama whose fans can sometimes so many bandwagon yeah, be fans. so obnoxious and you've got, you know, the Houston Astros who have made it to however many world series in a, you know, in a row, it feels like, and it's because of the, cheating. see, I don't know if we would, I don't know if we would feel the same way about the Houston Astros if it wasn't for that cheating scandal. Well, right, I think but, we would view the Houston Astros as a Golden State Warriors type team if that, it wasn't for that cheating scandal. But that's what I'm saying. Like with the teams that have been prominent, especially or like even if you want to go back to the Patriots too, like because they have those kind of like, you know, very hateable qualities to go with the fact that they have all the success that they have. Like that's why I think we feel differently about like okay we don't this is the Warriors' fifth championship in a decade that's fine you know they've you know we we love the Warriors as opposed to oh man we got to watch the Patriots play win another Super Bowl or oh man cool it's Alabama versus you know Georgia the in the SEC slash national championship game again like you know mm. I, I think that's because they've got a lot of likable qualities um, I think that's why they don't really have that. You know, unless you just really hate Draymond Green, I don't think there's really any qualities about the Warriors that really just wakes up and says, "You know who I hate? Steph Curry." I don't think that person really. Exists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for those people that just love them some LeBron James. That that's true. That is true. Well, that about wraps it up here for this week's edition of the Crash Course Podcast. Thank you guys all for listening, watching. Uh, remember, you can like us on Facebook. Uh, uh, 3C Media. You can go follow us on Twitter at 3C Media Sports. Go to the YouTube channel, 3C Media. We're over 100 subscribers, 108 as we record this podcast right now. So go over there. We're, B. Scott and I are about to record uh, a little bit of a, a hit on Sam Ellinger. Uh, that changed for the Colts. That can only be seen on YouTube. So if you want to see that, go subscribe to the channel. Ring the bell. Also, 3C Media on TikTok. We're over 2K followers over there. Uh, we're going to be going live and having all the breakdowns of the IHSAA football tournament uh, live every Friday night, talking about the scores, the big games that are happening. So make sure you're following over there. And remember, you can listen to us every week on the Crash Course Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever podcasts can be heard, you can hear the Crash Course Podcast. B. Scott, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Brandon underscore Scott 87 on Twitter. You can find me at crash course FM on Twitter. We'll be back next week with another podcast, but until then have a good one, everybody.